What I'd like to talk about today is the fact that we don't live in normal times anymore. Uh, we are living in deeply abnormal times. And the abnormality is driven by uh, deep disruptions to the way in which we conduct our know, political and economic life and the life between nation states. We see it in geopolitics, we see it in geoeconomics, we see profound disruptions being driven by technology, the slow burn disruption that is sustainability, population, climate change, and the impact which all these have cumulatively on the capacity of our political systems to remain abreast and to chart a strategy forward given the systemic disruptions which are simultaneously underway. It doesn't matter whether you are Labor, Liberal or Calathumpian in this country or its variants around the world, the great systemic disruptions are challenging the body politic in uh, democracies uh, around the world today, large and small. On geopolitics, uh, you know what the great disruptions are. We have the most unpredictable American president uh, since the birth of the American Republic for friends, for foes, for allies. We see that reflected in his actions uh, towards traditional alliance structures. We see that uh, also in his uh, preparedness to tear up the rules of the global uh, rules-based order in trade. We also see it in terms of his assault on venerable institutions such as the Human Rights Council in Geneva. We also see as part of the great geopolitical disruption and the rise of a increasingly confident China, drawing strength from and leverage from its power, its economic power, drawing also uh, from that to chart now a new course to paraphrase what its leader Xi Jinping said just two weeks ago as leading the reform of global governance, the new phrase that Xi Jinping is now using. Um, and the reflection of that in various regions and localities around the world. You touch it, you see it, you feel it, wherever you travel. Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, I'm always asked one question, which is who is Xi Jinping and what is driving him and what does he want to do? And then as part of the great geopolitical disruption, we have um, a Russian Federation which is laughing all the way to the bank. Um, can't believe it's luck that we have such an unpredictable White House at present. On the geo geoeconomic dislocations and disruptions, of course, uh, the change in the center of gravity, we've been anticipating that in this country for decades now, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It ceased being a projection, it's now a reality against most of the measures, most of the indicators, driven not just by China, but primarily so, but the still continuing economic significance of India, uh, of Japan, and the emergence slowly, steadily of India. But with China's rise and its economic dominance, the impact which it now has on global standard setting, it now has in terms of global norm setting in international commerce, investment, and in digital commerce and the digital economy. These are profound new disruptions. Beyond those, of course, uh, there's technology itself and the great disruption which comes not just from what we focused on for the last 25 years in information technology, um, but the wonderful wide new world of, of artificial intelligence. To the point now that friends and colleagues with whom I work in the United States are no longer confident to project that classic labor substitution theory that we've all learned at university, seen applied over decades now in economies around the world as new technologies emerge, people are displaced, but they are absorbed elsewhere into an economy so that full employment and fuller in, uh, employment with rising living standards sustains the social and political contract on the way through. But with the quantum changes and labor dis displacement potential of artificial intelligence, uh, the question now uh, in the minds of many of the world's most respected economists is whether that can be sustained into the future. And are we going to end up now with large scale intergenerational unemployment in the decades going forward? And the impact which that has in terms of long term social and political stability.
this is not unique to our country. It's a reflection of um, developments around the world. Most political leaders that um, I run into in, uh, in Europe or in the Latin American countries have a similar story to tell. It's a great disruption of itself. Producing enormous dividends, technology is never to be feared, but at the same time, uh, being now the harbinger of unprecedented uh, social and political changes, which our political systems are struggling to keep cope with. The slow burn one, sustainability, population, the debate which rages in this country, but many around the world as well. And of course, the, the biggest slow burn, faster burn that is climate change being a profound disruption as well. As uh, companies around the world are now increasingly for the first time in the United States and elsewhere being required to reckon with uh, the uh, risk which climate change uh, represents to their own corporate balance sheet for the future, the actions which they're required to take, whether or not their governments are acting or not. Throw these together, this amalgam of systemic disruptions um, you heard it from me first. I have some uh, compassion uh, for Malcolm Turnbull uh, running a government uh, in Australia or anyone who takes that position from him in the future, given the intersection of these systemic disruptions, as I have compassion and sympathy uh, for Merkel, uh, for May, for Macron, and those who find themselves in similar positions around the world. Uh, these are difficult times and therefore requiring far-sighted national strategies to maximize advantages within this systemic dislocation while minimizing the risks uh, to the fabric of our society and the body politic. The reason I've said all that by way of introduction is because when we look at the phenomenon of China's rise, it is a driving factor and force in all five of the great disruptions I've just referred to, of geopolitics, of geoeconomics, of technological change, the AI revolution which Xi Jinping is planning for his own country, climate change, sustainability, the impact for all of us if China doesn't get its domestic act on greenhouse gas emissions under control, as well as the debate raging in this country about the impact of China as an authoritarian state on the well-being of democracies around the world and their capacity to continue to sustain themselves into the future. So therefore, among these great dislocations, the China factor is alive in all of them. And therefore, it requires of a country like ours to have about us a long-term, consistent, national China strategy, which can embrace complexity, which can embrace uh, where our interests coincide, and which can embrace also where our interests do not coincide with China. This requires a maturity in our national conversation on the question of China, which I have found absent here in recent years. Given all that, then a question which I'm often asked around the world, and particularly given the pattern of my own research at present is, what is Xi Jinping's worldview? What does he actually want? We see the sheer metrics of Chinese economic power and all of its um, sub-matrices growing, usually exponentially, uh, if not in a defined linear trajectory. And despite all the warnings and all the prognostications over the decades that this model was unsustainable, here we are, uh, 40 years into the reform project launched by Deng Xiaoping in 1978, and it's still roaring along. China, a one-party state with a semi-capitalist system, an authoritarian capitalist system, about to become the largest economy in the world. And so the question I'm asked is, given the sheer matrices, uh, given the sheer dimensions of China's emerging economic power, its foreign policy power, and its growing military capability, the urgent question in most capitals around the world is, what is China's worldview? What does China want? And that's what I spend <coughs> a lot of time on. Let me just summarize it for you as best I can in seven sharp points. Number one, never forget in this one-party state 
that the number one objective of Xi Jinping and the party leadership is to preserve the party in power. It's the nature of the system. It is a revolutionary party. It won a, a civil war against the nationalists in 1949. It did so by violent means, and it intends to remain a one-party state for the foreseeable future. And therefore, threats to the authority of the party and will always loom as a number one priority for the Chinese regime to deal with. We should never, ever forget that. Hence why you would have seen, those of you who studied the China um, project in detail, a reassertion of the centrality and the influence and the importance of the party over the traditional mechanisms of the state within the Chinese system in determining the future course of economic policy, for example. And why, therefore, we see a reassertion of the importance of ideology over sheer pragmatism in the, in the administration of Xi Jinping. All about Xi Jinping's determination to defy Frank Fukuyama's definition of the end of history, that we're all destined for one glorious liberal democratic future around the world, brought about on the shoulders of uh, ever accumulating uh, standards of living and average income levels rising giving rise to the automatic sentiment for freedom of political expression, translating itself one way or another through to becoming um, a contestable democratic system. That's the Fukuyama definition of the end of history. That's not Xi Jinping's definition of the end of history. And he's determined to prove Fukuyama wrong. So therefore, what I say to most audiences around the world is, let's have a very clear-eyed view about this. That's Xi Jinping's worldview, Article 1. Article 2, maintain the unity of the motherland. Sounds like a hackneyed phrase to those of us who uh, are unaccustomed to the way in which it is read and interpreted within China domestically, but it is of central relevance uh, to the Chinese uh, political project. And that is uh, on questions of Taiwan, on questions of Xinjiang, on questions of Hong Kong. Whenever we see political dissent, or in the case of Taiwan, signs of further separatism uh, from the current nature of the relationship across the Taiwan Straits, this is at a level of importance on the agenda of the Standing Committee of the Politburo that few of us in the rest of the world are quite familiar with. Uh, it is of intense political relevance. Number three, uh, near and dear to the hearts of a gathering convened here at EWISE is the sustainability of the Chinese economic reform project. And here, the challenge for Xi Jinping is exquisite. How do I continue to reform the economy? How do I continue to raise living standards? How can I continue to bring uh, out of poverty the 80 million Chinese who remain within poverty um, through an increasing level of sustainable economic growth while not losing ultimate control of the economy through the agency of the party. And here is where you have the complete intersection of that agenda with his primary agenda, which is to ensure the party remains in control. For those of you who are interested in, in this in some granularity and detail, if you're from investment houses or other institutions, I draw your attention to work which uh, we do at the Asian Society Policy Institute in New York, the body of which I'm um, president. Uh, if you go to our website, you'll see there what we call the China Economic Dashboard. We produce it every three months. And it is our attempt to analyse the extent to which China is giving effect to the next generation of market reforms in the economy, which it articulated in 2013, just after Xi Jinping became president. Reforms of competition policy, reforms of state-owned enterprises, reforms of the foreign trade system, the foreign investment regime, reforms of the regulatory environment for land, for labour, for the environment, financial reform, fiscal reform. These are not abstract benchmarks which uh, we seek to apply. Uh, these are the benchmarks which the Chinese articulated themselves in the 2013 reform blueprint uh, for the transformation of the current economic model into the next economic model, which China has determined to, as necessary to generate the growth levels it needs to provide rising living standards, as well as uh, liberation from poverty for those who still remain within it. 
the pace of reform so far in the last five years has been slow. Um, of the 10 barometers of uh, fundamental economic reform, we see serious advance in only two. Again, I draw your attention to the analyses that we put out on this. this. These are not casual observations. These are based on serious reflections by our own team of economic consultants looking at the data produced from the Chinese system itself. Agenda item number four in the Xi Jinping worldview is to ensure a benign strategic environment with China's neighboring states. China has 14 land borders, the largest number of any country in the world except for the Russian Federation, which also has 14. And so in the history of China, uh, almost as a matter of geographical logic, problems have arisen because we've had problems with the neighbors, either Japan, uh, or from the Manchurians, who then occupied the country and became the Qing dynasty, from the Mongolians, who occupied the country and became the Yuan dynasty, and the Xiongnu, uh, who gave enormous problems to the Han. This is deeply etched into China's historical and strategic worldview. And therefore, deeply imbibed within the Chinese leadership is a paramount importance to these 14 relationships, everywhere from Kazakhstan to Vietnam. And China, therefore, wants as benign a relationship with those countries as possible. It does not wish or aspire to any form of territorial acquisition. It sees no need for that at all. But it does want a foreign policy relationship with those countries, which is as quiescent to Chinese interests as possible. Agenda item number five out of the seven is looking to China's continental periphery across the vast Eurasian con continent, how can China produce there a wide strategic buffer uh, through to the Atlantic, which for them is a benign strategic environment and increasingly one of economic opportunity. It's the overall strategic logic which forms the framework around the Belt and Road Initiative, Idailu. Uh, which many of you in this room would have studied. The sheer dimensions of what's being planned and considered as Idailu, uh, the BRI, uh, is beyond anything conceived of in the days of the Marshall Plan. If you simply look at the economic metrics alone, this is 10 Marshall Plans against the relatively conservative estimates being put around the Chinese project at present. It's not all beer and skittles. There are problems, there are limitations of finance, there are reactions from local governments about debt accumulation. There are reactions from local governments about <coughs> levels of local control. But my knowledge of the Chinese system and seeing how they've operated in decades past, to me suggests strongly that in fact what China does in these sorts of grand policy adventures is to use the Chinese zoibu kanibu. Go one step and look and see how, how you've gone. And then to learn from the experience of what has just occurred, both positive and negative, and improve on the next time through. So therefore, I think Ch China right now is experiencing a whole raft of problems as it engages in Idailu, the Belt and Road Initiative. But for those who simply conclude that as a result of this, China will go into some sort of strategic retreat from it, I think fundamentally misunderstand the nature of the Chinese system. One of my Oxford colleagues has um, spoken to me in recent times about her field research of Chinese investment activity in Ethiopia over a 10 year period, looking at the first Chinese investments from state construction firms uh, in that country a decade ago, which were clumsy, uh, which were alienating for the local communities, uh, which were increasingly politically unpopular. Roll the clock on 10 years, each wave of new activity by those firms has in fact transformed the local political landscape in her objective analysis, she's a Dutch scholar, um, to one where local communities now have 85% local labor participation, uh, best wage rates in the country, parallel to other projects. Uh, and thirdly, huge local, local community buy-in. So therefore the assumption that um, China does not learn from its mistakes on the road, I think is quite wrong. <laughs>
Number six in this uh, agenda uh, of uh, Xi Jinping's worldview is not the continental periphery, but the maritime periphery. The maritime periphery for China has been much more problematic than the continental periphery. The maritime periphery has seen uh, not only uh, the problems associated uh, with Japan during the war, uh, but also uh, the problems which have arisen from their perspective with the overwhelming strategic presence of the United States Pacific Fleet in the period since 45. And this is where we see the strategic intersection of these two giant worldviews rubbing up against each other like tectonic plates uh, and moving sharply, uh, almost geographically, down the first island chain all, and through Southeast Asia. China is not in the mood at all to bring on any conflict with the United States in its Pacific periphery because it fears that if such a conflict were to arise prematurely that it would not win. At the same time, on core questions uh, of national unity, including Taiwan, but increasingly also China's assertion that its core national interests are also alive in the South China Sea and its territorial claims there, then the ability of the Chinese system to readily back down over any such core interest claim becomes more limited as time rolls by. And seven in this um, agenda of uh, China's um, worldview under Xi Jinping uh, is what I would describe as the reform of the global rules-based system in a manner which is more conducive to Chinese interests and values. This has barely begun, but there's some evidence of this already happening in the world. <coughs> and to be fair to Xi Jinping, he's been upfront and direct about it. Uh, when I read a uh, speech of his only a couple of weeks ago um, on the reform of global governance and China's proposal to take a leading role in it, this is a complete departure from the ancient axioms, or now apparently ancient axioms of, of uh, Deng Xiaoping, of uh, Tao Guang Yang Hui, Zhuo Bo Dang Tou. Hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. Deng's axiom given to generations of Chinese diplomats, go out there, keep your head down and follow the general consensus. We're in the business of nation building. We're not in the business of international political leadership. Uh, the formal uh, conclusion of that period was in fact in 2014, Central Work Conference on uh, Foreign Policy conducted by the Chinese Communist Party in November of that year. And in the most recent one of those conferences, which occurred only a few weeks ago, is where we heard in clarion clear terms uh, Xi Jinping's uh, instruction to the, to the nation's foreign policy and international policy elites more generally that it's time for China to take the lead. The form and shape that that takes institution by institution, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, um, uh, the G20, remains to be seen. But the internal conclusion within the system <coughs> is that China will no longer simply be a price taker in terms of pre-existing Western norms and values evident in the construction of these institutions post 45, but will now seek to assert its own norms and values into the system. This is a work in progress and one that's barely begun. But the extent to which China is serious about it is reflected by the increasing number of Chinese personnel that you see in multilateral institutions around the world and the, the sheer competence of these personnel as well. And parallel track to the above is China's decision to appoint a range to establish and to staff a range of new multilateral institutions outside the UN and Bretton Woods machinery such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, such as the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and others, including the New Development Bank. There you have, in my crude summary, um, the worldview from the inside out, in terms of the assumptions which I think inform the way in which the Standing Committee of the Politburo look at the key political and economic challenges they face today. So what's all that mean for us? And I'll conclude my remarks um, after this next point and we can pursue the rest in conversation.
If you go through that and seek to apply the logic of what I've just described, if it's accurate, and uh, many things I've just said would be contested by others, but if it's accurate and you apply it to us, what do we think it means? My conclusion is that Australia, uh, looked at th from Beijing's lens, is a significant country. We are seen in the Indo-Pacific region as a major power, probably one of four, uh, India, Japan, Korea, ourselves, maybe five if you include Indonesia. We are seen as a significant player globally because of our membership of the G20 and our activism in the multilateral world. And we're also seen as significant because we're an ally of the United States. These shape very much the contours of a Chinese analysis. We're also deeply relevant uh, to China's long-term economic trajectory because of the centrality of Chinese energy policy to whatever it does for the long-term economy. In a country which has been domestically energy deficient, particularly in such categories as uh, uh, LNG um, and in petroleum, uh, we figure prominently on LNG. Also, we're relevant to that part of the core agenda of the Chinese leadership, uh, which deals with uh, China's relationship with its 14 neighbouring states. Why is that? Because of our engagement with the ASEANs and our direct bilateral diplomacy with countries such as Vietnam, such as Laos, such as Myanmar, such as Thailand, such as India. We are particularly relevant in terms of China's interest in its maritime periphery because of our allied relationship with the United States and the rolling debate about our own engagement with uh, the US Pacific Fleet in operations in the South China Sea and in waters within the broader Chinese um, uh, maritime zone. And beyond that again, we are seen as relevant to China's interests in reforming the institutions of global governance because we happen to be in all of them and because of our G20 membership, we're in one of the more significant ones. So for those reasons, looking at it through the prism of Chinese interests, uh, we are not their number one concern, but we are in their top 20 concerns. And I would say we're probably in their top 12 concerns. Let me hazard myself even further. If you were sitting around a central strategy session with the Chinese leadership, what would be the countries of primary interest to themselves? The United States, of course. The Russian Federation speaks for itself. The Koreas, if I could treat, that, treat those as a single entity for the time being. Japan, of course, for reasons of proximity in history. India, proximity in history. Vietnam, proximity in history. And then more broadly in the global economic states, of course, the big three in Europe, the United Kingdom, Germany and France. And then and its fellow BRICS states, Brazil and South Africa. So Australia, given where we are in the region and given where we are with the Americans and given where we are in terms of Chinese energy policy and the other factors that I referred to before, we therefore loom as I think one of China's top 12 preoccupations. We should never overestimate, but nor should we underestimate uh, the importance of these things. So therefore, my overall conclusion is that what we therefore do uh, and say about China matters in Beijing. Whether we choose to accept that or not, our own domestic political debate. And by definition, what China does and says about Australia matters because of its deep confluence with Australian uh, interests uh, in the region and in the world. Which brings me to my core point in the presentation here today is it's why therefore Australia requires an enduring, and to the extent that we can achieve it, bipartisan national China strategy. One which is comprehensive as opposed to one which is simply segmented. One which takes into the totality
of its view, our political relationship, our trade relationship, our investment relationship, our technology relationship, our universities, tourism, defence, foreign policy, human rights, as well as the global rules-based system. Rather than what I've seen to date is something much more piecemeal than that. Therefore, the question I would leave us with for the purposes of the conversation and for the government's uh, own reflection in time is how can that therefore be engineered in a country such as ours in a contestable democracy such as ours? I would simply offer two or three thoughts. The first is we all recognise, Labor and Liberal, government and opposition, that this is a complex and difficult relationship. Anyone who thinks that dealings with China, given the dimensions of the great global disruptions that we discussed earlier today, uh, is a simple matter, is deluding themselves, simply deluding themselves. The conversations I have in London, in Paris, in Berlin, in Moscow, uh, as well as obviously in Washington, in Ottawa, and in countries in the region, all have a similarity to them about dealing with a rising China at a time of deep transition in the global order. So point number one is a mature reflection or recognition on the part of all participants in the debate that this is not easy. It's hard because it's new and it's happening at scale and it's affecting all of our interests and all of our values simultaneously. Number two, to recognise in a relationship like this with China that within its framework, there are going to be areas where we have and share common interests. For example, in counterterrorism, but where we do not share common interests, for example, on questions of the durability of the American alliance in the region. That there are areas where we have common values, such as sustainability, China's decision to accede to the Paris Agreement on climate change. <coughs> and other areas of values where there is no commonality between us, such as classical uh, human rights, as defined by the Universal Declaration of 1948. But simultaneously to recognise that there is a vast area which is grey, where there is no obvious distinction in terms of an Australian interest or a Chinese interest, or an Australian interest or a counter interest. To have the maturity in our relationship to understand that framework of complexity. And that's why I constantly call for a balanced national China strategy. And my final observation is this, for those framing such a strategy in this country to understand the core discipline, which is the difference between operational policy and declaratory policy. In 2010, in our government, we developed a national China strategy at a, as a cabinet level exercise. It took us two years given the complexity of what we were dealing with. I don't need to rehearse for you some of the disagreements we had with China in that period. We prevented Chernalco from taking over Rio Tinto. This was a major disagreement between the two countries. Uh, we, uh, as a government, uh, made our position on human rights in Tibet plain. Uh, we did not support Huawei entering into the national broadband network. Uh, we publicly defended the legal rights of Stern Hu. We announced a defence white paper just down here at Garden Island, which uh, doubled the submarine fleet and increased the surface fleet by a third against the uncertain contingencies arising in our wider region. All these resulted in some negative reaction from Beijing. But guess what? China experiences that in all of its external relationships. And the problem here in this country is we seem to think that we're Robinson Crusoe. That's not the case at all. The key wisdom here is to understand what is best done privately, quietly, operationally, and without public fanfare, where it is necessary to make public proclamation, and what might constitute the useful characteristics of a public declaratory policy. And my one domestic political observation today is where I believe uh, Malcolm Turnbull got it radically wrong in December last year was his uh, irresponsible public declaration and that the Australian people had finally stood up against China. Apart from the fact that Malcolm's Chinese isn't much chop, the bottom line is he could not have chosen a single more offensive phrase to use in Beijing given it was a paraphrase 
of the expression used by Mao on the 1st of October 1949 as, as he proclaimed that the Chinese people had stood up after a hundred years plus of foreign occupation. There is no more offensive phrase that you could have chosen and which I would ask, why then use it? What was the point? What was the public policy being prosecuted here? There is therefore a value in declaratory <coughs> policy, properly seasoned, but most mature states engage their most complex relationships with an operational policy which does not depend on, shall I say, provocative public declaration on a rolling basis. And the fact that we've now had a six month freeze in ministerial visits between, ministerial contact between the two countries is abnormal and not normal in the 46 year history of the Australia-China diplomatic relationship. It is unique. To conclude, seven years ago in Beijing, I gave a speech as foreign minister at the time. I was between jobs. And the speech I gave in Beijing was along these lines. Australia and China, a third way of managing this relationship, neither conflict nor kowtow. As I reflected and read through the speech again, uh, just in recent times, as I'm uh, uh, writing uh, another tome, uh, what I was seeking to convey then is that there is an intelligent way through this complexity, uh, which doesn't see us automatically polarised into one side of this argument or the other, but navigating a sensible course through the middle. I think as a nation we're capable of doing that, but it will require on the part of all of us an unprecedented level of political maturity on something so central to all of our interests for the future. I thank you for your attention. You know, I thought that was a really um, thoughtful, evidence-based and, and you know, interesting summary of, uh, I guess, an idea of what you want and what Beijing actually wants. I remember listening to that remarkable uh, keynote address that you gave at Davos not long mm. after the uh, upsetting or the upset in the US election and he really worked hard to try and portray Beijing as this new champion of the global liberal order, uh, you know, the protector of free trade. And I think at the time, it was what the world wanted to hear mm. to some extent. Do you think in retrospect, there's sincerity there? Is it all rhetoric? Is there sort of a realistic element to those words? I think there's um, a real danger of what I just described as Western projectionism about China. That is, um, the general Western engagement with China going right back to the days of the 70s and 80s, uh, has been driven by a view, particularly after Deng Xiaoping uh, entered the scene, is that slowly but surely, uh, China would transform itself into a country which accepted uh, the principles of the liberal international order and progressively become a liberal democracy itself. That was the unstated underlying assumption of generations of US policy leaders. And whether it was <clears throat> Bob Zelik's famous um, stakeholder um, policy as announced, I think in 2005, or other articulations of it as well. Part of my reason for commenting in the way in which I've done today is I think there's always been a high degree of naivety about the second part of that proposition in particular. The nature of the Chinese system is that it's an authoritarian state. It's become an authoritarian capitalist state. Okay. And Xi Jinping sees that as an alternative model. And there was nothing in the Davos speech which actually suggested that that had changed. I think Westerners wanted to hear something different to what was being said. So for the future, what difference does it make? I think China historically has seen itself very much as having had the institutions of the global system as it were presented to it as having already been determined with China not at the table and incorporating within it, within it a number of institutional and value-based assumptions, some of which China can happily live with and some of which they find problematic and not just in human rights. Now I think with China's rise globally, there is a much more assertive and confident view by China that it can in fact begin to write the rules 
rewrite some of the rules for the future of the system in a manner more consistent with China's own domestic political tradition. Um, and that is where we're going to run into a series of, I think, very difficult policy debates in the future with our Chinese friends. Not impossible to resolve, but we should be wide-eyed about it uh, rather than having in the back of our minds this slightly soppy Western assumption that it's simply one Fukuyama-type story drawing towards a happy conclusion. It's not like that. If it's quite stark, then what Xi Jinping wants and what China is, which is a one-party authoritarian state, and quite clearly, as you mentioned, with Belt and Road, with AIB, they are trying to, I guess, propagate that somewhat across different regions. Is the idea of, of a rising, developing nation and that ultimately ending up in conflict something that's inevitable? No, it's not. Um, uh, the next book, short one I hope to write, will be on China and the United States, The Avoidable War. Uh, my friend and colleague from Harvard, uh, Graham Allison, has just written and circulated a book, China, the United States, Destined for War, The Thucydides Trap, for those of you who follow the literature. And I was with Graham when he was writing this in Harvard. It was my first year of political exile from Australia. I was looking for, I was looking for refugee status at the time. And uh, so Harvard was the, was the only safe haven. Uh, but I, I don't accept the proposition that, we, that there is some predetermined course towards conflict. And there are a range of reasons for that. Um, I think um, Chinese are very much guided by history. They have known that war in the past has been extraordinarily damaging to their own country. Um, secondly, uh, the future administrations of the United States um, are capable, together with Chinese administrations, of taking a different course of action. Uh, and thirdly, uh, China itself, slowly, um, through its own great global engagement, um, has changing societal views as well as more Chinese travel in the world and understand the complexity of the world beyond China's shores. So these things are all washing through, but uh, that can be brought together as a common national script shared by China and the United States as a way to navigate, um, let's call it uh, the world through a difficult point of transition as China emerges as the largest power by mid-century. Um, or it can just be left to happenstance. And then you end up with, I think, a much greater risk of conflict by accident and maybe ultimately by design. What does a coherent, comprehensive, and yet politically palatable strategy for Australia towards China look like? Well, if, given what I said before in terms of its core characteristics, has to deal with the totality of the relationship. Secondly, recognize within it agreement, disagreement, and gray zones. And thirdly, the difference between operational and declaratory policy. I won't here give you what I think should be the operational characteristics of such a strategy, because it's something which should be dealt with confidentially within the realms of government. And that's exactly what we did in the two year long interagency process, the intelligence community, treasury, foreign investment review board, <laughs> Uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, Defence, the economic agencies as well. It's a very complex piece of work, but it can be done. Um, and I, there is a great danger in not doing it um, because what happens is we then as a nation speak with a thousand different voices uh, rather than one well-deliberated one. Um, when I talk about a balanced third way in managing the Chinese relationship for Australia, as I said, the, the polarities are not to think that we're into a world of yi kertou, ar kertou, san kertou, um, kowtow one, kowtow two, kowtow three, or that conflict's inevitable. There is a vast terrain up the middle of that. Um, but it doesn't require this country, Australia, uh, surrendering its core Western values either. We are who we are. Uh, this is the nation we are. The reason so many people migrate here is that they uh, appreciate the fact that we come from a tradition of independent laws, a legal system, um, and we have uh, parliamentary elections and we are a parliamentary democracy, uh, robustly so, as many of us engaged in the process have discovered. 
Um, and that's who we are. And therefore, when we run into our Chinese friends in international gatherings, and they seek to reflect a different view of uh, civil liberties, for example, we should have no qualms whatsoever about asserting our disagreement with that. At the same time, working furiously with our Chinese friends uh, collaboratively on what we do to sustain the planet through applying from top to bottom the principles of environmental sustainability and everything that China does. And if China wasn't going to head in that direction, then we may as well all give up tomorrow because China single-handedly has a capacity to fry the planet um, unless they're working with us collaboratively on question just given 1.4 billion people. Does that require Australia to reassess its traditional alliances with the likes of the US? This was a question that came up you know, a year ago when it looked like Washington was certainly reassessing its own alliances with traditional friends versus foes. Is that a review that should be taking place given the vulnerability or the opportunities presented to Australia by China versus the United States? No. Uh, I have a very simple view which I've held ever since beginning my studies of China, that the underpinning strategic realities which gave rise to Australia's alliance with the United States in 1941, um, and the confluence of values between the United States and Australia, uh, are as valid today as they were then, uh, despite the eccentricities of the current US president. Um, and that secondly, uh, we are perfectly capable of managing a strategic alliance with the United States and a vast economic relationship with China simultaneously. It just requires high level political leadership, a coherent national strategy and a deeply sophisticated diplomacy to do so. The moment at which we Australians begin to have our thinking locked into a view either induced by Beijing or by Washington that this is a binary, that's when we should give up the game. We should never do that under any circumstances. This is not a binary proposition. We can walk and chew gum. We are smart people in Australia if we choose to do this well. Uh, and we can avoid egregious mistakes like the one which occurred in December last year if we have a coherent national strategy. Thank you very much. This is Brad, uh, David Olson, King of the Thousands. We meet briefly in China with others and make your comments on this. Okay, yeah. Um, a question really is around the, the apparent difference between the views of corporate Australia around China in particular, you know, where most corporations broadly see economic opportunity, want to do things, and yet within government we've got this focus on defence and security. I just wonder how do we bring this conversation together so that it's not security and defence trumping commerce all the time, which seems to be what's playing out consistently in our engagement at the moment. And is there a mechanism for us to bring the, you know, the corporate view of the world you know, more closely into the, the conversation? With the yeah, just before coming back to Australia, I was in um, Ottawa. No, Montreal. There was a conference uh, co-hosted by the BCA and their Canadian equivalents, the Business Council of Australia and their Canadian counterparts. And dare I say, the conversation we're having here today is the one which is being had right across Canada, um, almost in parallel terms. So in my conversation with the BCA, to go to your immediate um, point, we said that there is a, a real need to have a, an Australian large Chatham House discussion uh, amongst principal corporates and, and the, let's call it the, the bureaucratic class and the political class about how the elements of what I've described as a national China strategy can be achieved on what I describe as a reasonable, sustainable bipartisan basis. Um, the point I'd make is that these things are not impossible. The tensions that we are speaking of today were quite evident in our period in office as well. But we did develop such a strategy. We had disagreements with China we never had a freeze in ministerial relations. Um, it's, a way, it's the manner in which you go about conducting the relationship. So my concrete suggestion would be, if the BCA is uh, the peak body here, um, or the, the other bodies are interested as well, uh, Aki and the rest, uh, then there's a way in which this can be convened. But for it to occur in, when I say a Chatham House environment, so that it can be done without 
an eye to the media coverage. It can be a substantive discussion about cold hard realities in relationship on the upside and on the downside. So we can produce a reasonable consensus. And I find that'll take time. It took us two years, okay? Um, and many of the internal reforms of the Australian government, which have been sustained on uh, policy coordination on the national security front, actually occurred in our government and were driven by those discussions. Um, but the overall dynamics and breadth of our national China strategy, which embraced the, the centrality of the trade and investment relationship, appear to have been somewhat lost. I think there's a way to do this, but we've got to ourselves as Australians be mature enough to de this. So that's my suggestion. You chap up the back there, or a couple. So, um, question, uh, my name is Dermot O'Gorman from WBF. Just a question on the Pacific. So it's been in the press quite a bit in the last month, but as you know, China's engagement in the Pacific is more than a decade old. Can you just give us some thoughts on, based on what you just talked about, how might we start to rethink our engagement both with China and the Pacific, but also with Pacific Island countries in terms of their relationship with China? Well, any Australian government worth its salt takes as its first and primary set of relationships uh, the countries of the Pacific Island Forum. I mean, uh, that is self-evident for reasons of history. Um, uh, strategic vulnerability. That's the pathway which uh, the Japanese sought to approach Australia by means of invasion. Uh, but also in terms of cultural affinity, because most of the Pacific Island countries have a deep affinity with this country in one form or another, or with our Kiwi cousins. So there's a lot going for us if we were sensible about it. Number two, what you do is that you sustain a long-term predictable um, uh, development uh, relationship with these countries uh, over the decades, uh, rather than go through the slash and burn exercise that we've had here, where uh, when I left office, uh, we had an annual aid program globally of 5.5 billion. And since that time, it's been cut by something like 2.2 billion in real terms per annum. You don't think our Pacific Island friends notice this? Um, they do. Um, and more broadly, it's noted as well. Uh, number three um, is to work with our Chinese friends, as I sought to, on maximising Chinese aid transparency. And so I had a Barney uh, with our Chinese friends at the Pacific Island Forum held in Townsville uh, at the, no, Cairns at the time uh, when I was Prime Minister on the question of a transparency compact with all aid donors to the Pacific, Japan, Korea, um, Australia, New Zealand, the European Union, and any other of the European bilaterals, including the British. So that everybody knew what everyone was doing where, okay? Because A, countries of the South Pacific require levels of coordination, which are often beyond national systems to cope. Uh, and B, it just means we're m making better bang for our buck uh, if we're working collaboratively with the European Union or the Japanese to do X, Y, and Z rather than competitively. When I put it to our Chinese friends at that Pacific Island Forum to become party to the compact, they rejected it. And I made my disagreement with their position quite bluntly known at that conference. Now, some progress was made a couple of years later when I was foreign minister um, at the um, uh, Development Assistance Conference uh, held uh, from the OECD uh, in Busan in South Korea on a global transparency uh, deal uh, for emerging aid donors. And if you go, therefore, to the text of it, there is a requirement on China to be uh, as transparent as uh, any other DAC partner uh, under the OECD agreement with what they're doing in aid as well. Do those three things um, that I've just suggested, then we're starting to cook with gas in terms of getting the South Pacific right. If we wander off the reservation on those three things, then we're going to end up with a problem. The final thing of which I'm quite proud is in our period in government, uh, we, through the Defence White Paper, we uh, confirmed the projects for the two helicopter carriers. 
um, in the Royal Australian Navy. As you know, we'd been without flat tops for about 30, 40 years. It had become an article of faith with Australian Labor governments that we don't like aircraft carriers, which is why the Navy people decide to call it something else, an LHD. So and when the Navy guys came to me, I said, that thing with a flat top, that's an aircraft carrier. No, 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 Prime Minister, that's, that's an LHD. I said, why do you call it an LHD? Because, because the Labor Party hates um, uh, aircraft carriers. Yes, Prime Minister, that's exactly why we've done it. Anyway, we got through it, but the mission was this, and I was so pleased to see a photograph of this the other day. And when natural disasters hit in the South Pacific, and they do all the time, that our friends there turn first and immediately to us to have the capacity to get field hospitals there within, an, within a day or two steaming time, much closer if the, these units were not based here, but in, instead in uh, Townsville. Um, and secondly, um, that um, with helicopter reach, you can go to any of the outer islands, etc. This was a deep learning coming out of the Indonesian tsunami of 2004. Uh, and rescuing people then. So now we have national capacity to do that across Pacific Island countries with those two very large expensive ships. That's part of the Australian mission. And I'm very proud to have been, you know, as George Bush Jr. would have said, the chief decider uh, in making sure that project proceeded. Hi, I'm Bates Gill. Is this Good. I'm Bates Gill with Macquarie University. Hi, Kevin. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the idea that Australia should develop a comprehensive and bipartisan national strategy towards China isn't exactly new. It's important. But that then raises this interesting contradiction. Uh, given all the importance of it, uh, as you've explained, um, and of course, even given what I would read to be the relative lack of daylight, really, between the two major parties in Australia uh, as to its approach to China, how would you explain then that such a national strategy has not been formulated? What's, what, what is in the way? Well, um, my function here is today is not to come and sort of rip into the Turnbull government. Um, I could happily do that. I'm speaking to an ALP fundraiser tonight. I'll do it there. Uh, but, uh, and uh, Warwick's going to come with me, so uh, right, right of reply. But um, so it's not, uh, my point here is not to engage in gratuitous commentary. I just don't think it's been a priority, this government. And therefore, this government has reacted uh, rather than uh, acted proactively. And it's reacted when uh, aspects of the China relationship have bubbled up in the domestic Australian debate, uh, most notoriously through the, um, you know, the foreign interference debate and the subsequent legislation. And so we've been in reactive mode. And to be fair, when our government was elected, for the first 12 months, we were as well. But I then herded the cats and said, guys and girls, uh, we need to get our act together. And we went through the process that we did. Uh, and I'm very glad we did. It was also a process we shared with the Americans and with the British. Um, so it's perfectly doable. And among reasonable women and men uh, on something as core to Australian national interests and values as this, I actually think it's achievable. I mean, there's plenty of other things to have a partisan fight about in Australian politics so that everyone you know, can go home and, you know, put their political scalps on the refrigerator and with a magnet, um, other than this one. This one should be beyond, frankly, and I think we can get there. As I said before, it requires a level of maturity perhaps we've not exhibited before. Um, Dr. Epstein, your former chief of staff, I hesitate to say this is not a Dorothy Dixon. <laughs> um, especially in my other capacity as a former bid manager for the Nancy on the LHD project, they definitely not aircraft carriers, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, but uh, look, following on from uh, Bates's question, I'm wondering whether the apparent chasm between our business community and our national security establishment, very broadly defined, 
and what I mean by very broadly defined is defined as advisors within government and some of our academic institutions is not perhaps is influenced by some of our national security establishment being in essence befuddled or having some of their perceptions clouded by their links with some of their partner national security establishments in particular in North America and their desire to maintain those relationships and balances of trust and sharing information and whether that clouds their judgment about our national interest on China. Well, thanks, David, for the uh, question. Um, let us say, in, in our own experience in government of developing our own national China strategy, I didn't sense a great pushback from the bureaucracy, our national <coughs> security bureaucracy, the intelligence community and the rest at the time. I think they were uh, willing partners. Um, uh, the great virtue of WikiLeaks, though, is if you um, see some of the stuff which the US Embassy was writing about me at the time, it was quite plain that those guys thought I was going to slide into some you know, pro-Beijing satrapy. Um, they obviously hadn't had a long conversation with me about some of those things. Uh, but I think our lot were okay. Um, also, now that I'm in the United States uh, and dealing with the US bureaucracy a lot, uh, Pentagon, state, as they all deal with their major national challenge, which is their own president. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I've got to say there is now, uh, I sense, even within the Trump administration, um, still an open mind about how to wrestle with the central question of war and peace, Thucydides' trap, or an avoidable war, and that those in the agency and elsewhere are wrestling with the same policy dilemmas. So they don't have a knee-jerk America first view to everything. As you know, that the tensions within the Trump administration are between that establishment and what in fact President Trump's doing. So I think uh, it's more likely to be the case, David, of just, as I said before in my answer to Bates' question, the political will of our government to frankly herd the cats and um, to ask some pretty basic and fundamental questions. One small example you remember from our term in government on uh, Afghanistan strategy. This is just apropos of uh, another example of dealing with the uh, community. Where you're in common field operations with the United States, um, it can be more complex. I remember our first National Security Committee meeting when I asked the defense leadership, what is our strategy for Afghanistan? And there was just generally blank looks because we're just doing stuff, okay. Okay, doing stuff is good guys and you are very good at doing stuff, but what's the strategy? How do we know when we have uh, executed the mission? Could you define the mission for me? Long pause. And so it became clear then on this question, to answer your um, point, that uh, they saw their principal interest and they confessed to this as um, serving the alliance needs of the United States. Um, now we changed that, and you saw an entire strategy developed around Oregon province, training the 4th Brigade of the Afghan National Army uh, to make sure that the Afghans had a capacity to exercise security control over that part of the country. It took us five years to do it. Aid program, 200 kilometers of road, hundreds of schools. Um, I remember opening mosques, uh, everything, you know, to give this part of the country a go, you know, to have uh, towards self-reliance. And we did it. And that gave you a narrative politically to actually put to the Australian people. So that is an example, uh, points in your direction, but on the China front, that was not my experience. I think um, people are prepared to think independently. Mr. Aaron Kenning from Black Moors. The US and, and China are on divergent paths when it comes to trade, international mm -hmm. trade. The US and practically everybody else. Yes. Uh, where you're seeing the US, in essence, America first, barriers up, and China making noises in fact, even going further than making noises, opening up. Uh, how do you see that landscape changing going forward? First question. And second question, how do you see the impact of that changing landscape on Australia? Um, 
Well, this, of course, is the um, topic of the day. And uh, at present, so far uh, on the trade front, um, we've had $34 billion of measures, in one direction countermeasures by the Chinese, $16 billion threatened for the next tranche, followed by another $16 billion, $50 billion. And now the, the tentative release of a $200 billion list by the United States with a 10% tariff attached for to give effect by September, October, after a process of internal uh, public consultation within the United States in terms of unanticipated reaction or impacts for American industry. Um, and the Trumpster has referred to another 200 billion as well. So because he likes big, beautiful numbers, um, and they are big and they are beautiful, in the eye of the beholder. Uh, that half a billion that he talks about, of course, is approximately the figure equivalent to the current dimensions of the bilateral trade deficit between China and the United States. So this is the way in which this president thinks. I mean, if we wanted to conduct a, a public seminar today on the definition of mercantilism, we'd bring in President Trump as exhibit A, uh, because that's what he's doing. So the real question in political economy is how far will this guy go? and what will China do by way of response in the meantime? I think China, in terms of its domestic politics, has no alternative but to respond in, by like measure. Authoritarian systems have politics too, and the politics within the leadership elite of China does not provide them with the flexibility to Julian lose face by simply being impassive in response to a direct measure from the Americans, which accuses the Chinese uh, of uh, gross violation of, um, of uh, free trading principles as well as the theft of intellectual property. So my fear is, absent a circuit breaker, that we are going to end up, um, come September, October, with um, uh, this second tranche um, in part, not in whole, this second 200 billion tranche, uh, being implemented as well. Uh, within the US administration, you're familiar here as I am with uh, how it divides on this question. Mnuchin, the treasury, uh, wants to fix this thing tomorrow. He's a, he's a Goldman's man. He understands how markets work. Um, you've got Lighthizer and you've got Navarro uh, running trade policy in the White House who are also part of the rolling seminar on mercantilism, except they actually wrote the papers as opposed to just having the student uh, at their feet, which is DJ Trump. And you've got uh, Wilbur Ross somewhere up the middle of this, not quite knowing which way to go. So I do not see at present, here we are moving towards the end of July, a circuit breaker, uh, which um, doesn't result in an unacceptable loss of political face. Final point is that because of, I think, the political reaction to this extraordinary statement by Trump in the last 24 hours in Helsinki, uh, he will now be on, on retreat, in retreat, which is more likely to cause him in the domestic political debate uh, in the United States to pivot to an even harder line on China, uh, given that he's so grossly overreached on Russia. So, uh, my final, final point is, I don't know when someone's initiated a large trade war or a large imposition of across the board tariffs, which sooner or later hasn't resulted in one form of recession or another. And what I think is the great global tragedy at present is that this might simply be the, the, um, the igniting spark uh, for recession, uh, as people are generally anxious about, let's call it geopolitics in markets, whether it's Brexit, whether it's uh, internal elections in Germany, et cetera, what's happening in Southern Europe, the dysfunctionality of Italian politics, you name it, and then suddenly you've got this trigger. Um, so the magic lies in who has the diffusing device between now and September. Mnuchin's working on one. Can he pull one out of the fire? On balance, uh, it's less probable than not. Beijing's been fairly measured up in the last few weeks, right? Where it said, you know, you hit us in the face, we'll punch you back. And that was kind of a little bit of a step up. How do you imagine they would respond to the next tranche and the next tranche, given that the maths doesn't add up? They don't import that much from the US. 
are they going to make it more difficult for American businesses? You know, and not to be kind of a bit cynical, but how does that present opportunities for Australia? I think the um, two points which come out of China's reaction is the temperature has gone up um, on the Chinese end. If you read People's Daily, Global Times and those sorts of newspapers, the anti-American commentary has actually become very sharp, describing the White House as lunatic, um, etc. This is in the last two weeks. I looked at a survey of the Beijing coverage about 48 hours ago. And you're right, prior to that, it was much more moderate. Secondly, on the consequence question, which is how does, Ch how does China now react? Um, you already see one unfolding action, which of course is replete with its own uh, difficulties and dangers, and that's the future valuation of the renminbi. Uh, the effective devaluation over the last six months of something north of five, six percent, uh, depending on which period you're covering, somewhere between five and eight um, percent. Uh, if China sees this as a way of dealing with the loss of competitiveness arising from tariff imposition, that is through the uh, adjustment of the currency, then we're, now, then we're then into a world of fresh pain <clears throat> as a trade war becomes a currency war. Um, but we need to keep a very clear weather eye on that. The other one which um, uh, presents problems of a different nature is uh, Xi Jinping needs growth to still be running at around about 6% to provide for domestic full employment. Um, if this begins to bite, given that 37% uh, of Chinese GDP is still part of the traded economy, 27% in the United States, 37% in China, then um, I reckon uh, he will have to once again pull the lever in terms of domestic stimulus, which will then uh, reinvigorate state-owned enterprises, compound domestic debt problems and retard the domestic economic reform program as we end up in, let's call it a policy-induced equivalent of what we faced in 08-09. So there are my two danger scenarios. So let's all offer a prayer to the saints this evening for Mnuchin to somehow obtain uh, the chutzpah uh, and the intellectual smarts to find a way through in, I think, these two critical months. This will be a central deliberation, as you know, at the Beidai He conferences of the Chinese Communist Party, which begin in two weeks' time, um, the annual retreat of the leadership to, um, to the seaside. Uh, and mindful of Chinese domestic politics, we should reflect on the fact that Xi Jinping will be under some domestic political pressure on this as well. Suddenly, there is an uncontrollable factor here. Uh, China wants predictability. This is not part of the predictability script. You mentioned earlier this you know, idea of soluble cable, which sometimes feels like is, is what they're doing with regard to you know, financial policy, reforms, mm. restructuring, investment. But to be fair, no one has attempted the, the scale of which the, mm. the economic project that Sydney is currently trying to sort out at the moment. What, what does China in relation to the rest of the world look like, do you think, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time? A big country to the north of us. Uh, <laughs> lots of people. The, uh, I've, I've been around long enough, not as long as Dick Wilcott, to have read a bunch of reports, uh, both academic and intelligence-based, predicting the imminent demise of China, uh, going back to probably the mid 80s. Um, and so far, uh, the model has managed to sustain itself. Um, I'm therefore very skeptical about any forward projection, given their capacity for Zoe Bull Carnival, which is, let's, let's go this far forward, direction seems right, oh, there's a problem, we'll adjust here. Um, I still therefore think that uh, you'll have an authoritarian political system. Um, in 10 years' time, I think you'll probably also have Xi Jinping still in control of it, uh, either as president, given the constitutional reforms, uh, or as party chairman, if a new position is invented. Um, Xi Jinping has no incentive to leave as the country's paramount leader, uh, personal, political, or as he would define the national interest. I think the medium term danger for China is not in terms of its internal political stability, 
Medium term danger is what I touched on in some of my remarks earlier today about the non-implementation of second wave market reforms in the economy. The blueprint's out there in 2013. It's a fantastic blueprint. You remember the one which said that the market shall in the future be the principal determinant for the allocation of economic resources. It was a single sentence fought over within the system for a year before that particular plenum, a third plenum of the 19th, of the, uh, of the 18th Central Committee. And it's a fantastic document. The problem is they haven't implemented it because in 2015, with the stock market implosion, <coughs> in China, uh, there was a long pause as people then reflected about whether this in fact was going to generate um, uh, too much uh, social and political reaction within the system, within the country, I should say. So that period since 15 to the present, we've had the reform program effectively on pause. One big exception, by the way, is Chinese innovation policy, which has been going leaps and bounds, but that's largely been through state effort. Uh, rather than what we describe as classic market reforms. So what I fear, if I was Xi Jinping and a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, and I should declare to those watching this program that I'm not, um, and have never been invited to become one, uh, and probably would not make the grade, uh, is if you start to bring in really suboptimal growth numbers because you're not generating the next wave of productivity-based growth in the economy, then your ability to continue to increase living standards and to escape the middle income trap, the strategic danger that China has identified for itself, that I think would be the big problem. <laughs>